The Campus Church at Pensacola Christian College invites you to rejoice in the Lord. in Genesis chapter 45, my minor in college was communications. Now that was a combination of speech and English. On the English side, I like literature better than sentence diagramming. So most of the English I took on that side was literature. So I know that sometimes it can be difficult to actually determine the climax of a story. But not this story. The climax in this story is so clear and so evident, and we are there today in Genesis 45. Joseph wouldn't declare himself. He would not, in several meetings with his brothers, he would not declare himself until he knew that they had actually come to a place of repentance in their own heart, especially toward what they had done to him. Now he knew that, became aware to him with a beautiful speech given by Judah in chapter 44, where he's pleading with this Egyptian ruler who he does not know is Joseph to please let me take Benjamin back home. I cannot do that to my father I cannot do it to Benjamin. And the the sincerity, even to the point of saying, let him go home, take me instead. Now Joseph knows where the heart of his brothers really is. There, there There are few, if any, more dramatic moments in all of Scripture than this climax of this story. But it's not just a climax of this story of Joseph and his brothers. It's also a climax of anyone who finds himself in need of a Savior and realizes that Jesus is the Savior. And that wonderful climax in his life. Joseph is the most beautiful picture of Jesus in the New Testament. And how in this chapter are Joseph and Jesus alike? I see at least four parallels between Jesus Christ and Joseph in Genesis chapter 45. Look at them with me, would you? First of all, they're alike in what they knew. See, Joseph knew his brothers before they knew him. Put their money back in their sacks, and when they got back and said, we're sorry, we don't know how that happened, and and they're told by... Joseph Stewart's, don't worry about it. I had your money. I put it back in your sack. Don't worry about it. And they're thinking, what's going on? The first time we came down here, he fussed at us and called us spies. Now he feeds us and gives us changes of clothes, gives all our money back and extra extra corn. Genesis 42, 8. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. Please don't find it strange that, that they didn't recognize Joseph. I, I, I've been a teacher for, for a long, long time. And I can remember students that had graduated eight, nine, ten years before, and I would run into them someplace in the mall or someplace out at a restaurant, and they'd walk up to me and say, you don't remember me, do you? And you know what you do? You you try to be polite, and you say, well, sure I do. And I'm sitting there thinking, who is this person? Of course I do. Yeah, how are you? And I'm thinking, please, Lord, help me. Give me a name. Please give me a name. <laughs> and that's only seven or eight years after they graduated. It's been 20 years since they've seen Joseph. I wouldn't find it so strange that they didn't recognize Joseph as much as I would find it strange that we don't recognize our Creator. Isaiah 1. 
The ox knoweth his owner, and they ask his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider or understand. We just don't get it. John 1, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. We didn't recognize him. Many today in this room this morning still don't recognize him, but he recognizes us, and he knows us, and Joseph knew them, and they didn't know him. He made us, and he speaks to us, and we don't recognize his voice. He made us, and he calls to us, and we ignore the call. He breathed life into us, and then he tells us the truth, and we reject it as though it's not the truth. Psalm 139, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought. Boy, curiously wrought, interesting phrase. It literally means to embroider, to stitch. As you were being put together in your mother's womb, God knew you. And you didn't know him. Psalm 139, O Lord, thou hast searched me. Search, interesting word, to examine intimately, to know everything about. Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down as I travel through the day and when I lie down at night and art acquainted with all, all my ways. For there's not a word in my tongue, but lo, thou knowest it altogether. God knows you, knows everything about you. Do you know him? He recognizes you. Do you recognize him? He speaks to you. Do you hear him? Jesus knows you profoundly. He knows you deeply. He knows you intimately. He knows your secrets, the meditation of your heart. He knows the thoughts of your mind. Joseph had known all of their secrets all along, but they didn't know Joseph knew. They didn't know it was Joseph to know. Jesus knows everything about you and then some. Jesus remembers the sins you have long forgotten. He knows. He knows. He knows what you try to hide. Joseph tried to get them to admit it. And Jesus will do his very best to try to get you to admit your condition. But not for the purpose of condemnation, but for the purpose of healing and forgiving. If you will allow him to forgive you. Joseph and Jesus are, are so much alike because of what they knew. He knows everything about me and miracle of miracles, even though he knows everything about me in the deepest, darkest secrets that I wouldn't share with anybody. He loves me anyway. Amen. They're alike in another way. How they loved. They're alike in how they loved. Joseph loved his brothers. They never loved him. They sold him to a caravan. Now, wouldn't you think, wouldn't you think, if caravans passed that way on a regular basis, how many years did they go up that same way to graze the flocks? And how many years did a caravan going north or south pass by them? Did they ever one time go to someone on that caravan and say, are you the guys we sold our brother to? And by the way, can you tell us what happened to him? I don't think they ever did. They didn't want to know. They not only thought he was dead, they hoped he was dead. Genesis 44 says they assumed he was. Yet, yet here's Joseph responding to them in, in both affection and love. And he loved them deeply. He broke down and cried. In Genesis 43, he cried. In chapter 45 here, verse 2, he cries. He then wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. He's not sniveling in the corner, not quietly wiping his eyes. He's crying out loud. Where'd that weeping come from? It came from a deep, 
down need for reconciliation with his brothers. To know that everything's okay between us. To know there's peace between us. He loved his brothers. They never loved him. He named his sons forgetting and double blessing. But the pain of this scene tells us he never quite got over the pain. And it's evident to us. Thoughts of his family never left his mind. Joseph's love was great and frankly surprising. But the love that Jesus Christ has for us is far, far, far greater. His thoughts have never left you. If he knew you when you were curiously wrought, he knows you now. He has searched you. He knows you intimately. And he loves you passionately. So we say, well, you know, God, God loved us. God loved us. You're not reading scripture right. God didn't just love you. God so loved you. There's a difference. There's a difference. I tell my wife occasionally that I love her. It's called maintenance. <laughs> I want her to know that I love her. We're driving down the road and we haven't spoken back and forth for a few minutes and I'm thinking... It's time. <laughs> Connie, I love you. And she looks at me. She does this all the time. She looks over at me, just bats her eyelashes like it. <laughs> but then there are those times when your heart is moved in true heartfelt thankfulness for what this woman has done for you and what she has been to you and the years that she stood beside you and the pain and anguish she endured with you. And there are times when I look at her and I don't just say, Connie, I love you. I look at her and say, Connie, I don't know what I would have done without you. I thank God for you. I love you more than I could possibly say. And we look at God's love for us and think, well, God loves us, God loves us. No, God so loved you. So loved you that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God doesn't just love you. He so loves you. He wept over Jerusalem when they wouldn't come to him that he might heal them. Joseph loved his brothers in spite of what they thought. What did they think? Well, he spoke harshly to them. He placed demands on them. He imprisoned Simeon. He put his cup in Benjamin's sack and accused him of stealing that cup. And they realized that no one in that group had taken that cup and they had been found out. They said it. God has done this. He, he's, he's been somewhat, from their perspective, unkind. And, and those were hardly acts of love in their opinion. And sometimes we look at God with the same questioning spirit. Does God love you and how does God show his love? And we look at things like the Ten Commandments. And, and people that don't know Christ look at the Ten Commandments and say, oh, look at this. God's just a God of rules. God's just a God of don't. Don't do this and don't do that. And we look at the Ten Commandments. Well, do you realize why God has to say these things to us. It's important that we understand our condition. And, and unless God told us these things, we would never know our condition. Why did God give you the Ten Commandments? So you could look at a picture of righteousness and realize that's not you. And you need help. Hold your place here in Genesis and go to Galatians chapter 3 with me, would you? Galatians chapter 3. Paul goes to great length to try to explain to us the purpose of the law in our life. And sometimes we look at the law as a harsh thing because we know in our heart we cannot keep it. And that's exactly the purpose for it. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Galatians 3, verse 19. He asks the question, wherefore then serveth the law? What is the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions. Now, please understand something. Grace and mercy precedes the law. The law was added. And, and why was it added? Because of transgressions. Till the seed should come. Not seeds. Seed. He describes that later. 
where he, where he discusses seed, not seeds, plural, and the seed being discussed is Jesus Christ. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Question, here's the comment. When you mediate, you mediate between two people, but the promises of God don't require you. God made the promise, and God's going to keep his promises. Is the law then, verse 21, against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Life cannot come by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, having said all that, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. And when we look at God, we look at some of the things that God tells us, and we're not careful, we look at God as, as a negative, as something bad, as a thoughtless and cruel ruler, and he is not. He gave us these laws. He spoke a little harshly to us to get us to understand we needed him. And if we come to him and understand a need, he points very quickly to his son and said, there's the answer for the need. Come to him by faith. True lack of love on Joseph's part would have just let his brothers go their godless way and eventually perish. And a lack of love on God's part would have been to let you go your godless way and never let you know you were wrong and that he had an answer. He could have ignored them and God could have just ignored us. It's God's love that leads us to an understanding of our own sin. It's God's love that causes us to face the harsh reality of our condition. Romans states it, there's none righteous, no, not one. Well, why did he tell us that? Because we're never going to seek what we have. We seek what we don't have. So he has to tell us, you're not righteous. God had to make us aware of our lack of righteousness. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all sinned and come short. We cannot change our condition. We can't match the glory of God. We can't match his righteousness, but the scripture states that righteousness can be imputed to us. Now, if you look up the word imputed there, it's a, it's a business term. It's a term of scales. Now, be careful, because when you think of scales, people think, well, my good and my bad. No, that's not what God is saying. God says, I'm going to impute righteousness unto you. But look at some scales with me. And what do we have? The law says we've done this. And we've done this, and we've done this, and we've done this, and we've done this. And the scale is weighted heavily against us. And we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is nothing we can do. We have no righteousness with which to try to balance the scales. But I'll tell you what God does. God says this, I'm going to impute righteousness to you. I'm going to give you the righteousness of my son, Jesus Christ, if you come to him by faith and ask him to be your savior. So there you stand with a scale heavily weighted against you and one single drop of the precious blood of Jesus Christ jerks that scale in your favor. He had to talk to us that way. I remember the day my wife went to work, and I went to work, and I got a call about 8.01, and her voice was not kind, and she said this to me, don't you ever look at me, and I thought, okay, I've done something, think. I thought, Connie, what is it? She said, I'm about to go in here and speak to 600 parents to try to get them to put their child in first grade next year and I'm wearing one earring. <laughs> now guys, you've all been there. It's not my fault. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it's not my fault. It's the wrong position to take at that time. <laughs> not going to work. I said, Connie, I'm on my way. Jump in the car. 
ran home, found that other earring, and got it over to the academy, and she got that earring in. Let me tell you something. I check earrings. <laughs> we don't leave the house now, so I'll say, look, oh, you turn your head. Okay, good, we got two. We're gonna, we're gonna go. <laughs> good to go. God had to say things to us. He had to bark at us a little bit. He had to tell us our condition. He had to make us aware of our faults. If he did not, there was no way we'd ever come to him and seek a remedy for the fault. He said this, the wages of sin is death. We must pay the price for sin or we can accept the fact that Jesus has paid it for us. Are you lost and do you feel buffeted by God? It's because he loves you, not because he does not. Joseph uses circumstances, Jesus used circumstances to drive men to him out of love so he could heal, forgive, and bless. Well, they're alike in what they knew. They're alike in how they loved. But they're also alike in how others responded. Everything that's happened in this story to this point has been an attempt to bring repentance to these godless men. Yet they didn't know it. In verse 3, look what he said. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. This is the first time Joseph spoke to them in Hebrew. Up to this point, he's always spoken to them through an interpreter. But if you look back... In that same chapter, you'll find that he cleared the room. He sent everybody out. It's just him and his brothers. And they don't understand Egyptian. So this is the first time he has spoken to them in Hebrew. I am Joseph. And they were troubled at his presence. I guess they were. Probably one of the, one of the most comical statements in all the word of God is they were troubled at his presence. Troubled? They thought this was it. Trouble, by the way, means terrified and trembling, and I think that's appropriate. What has God done up to this point to bring these men to repentance? Well, he gave them great need. He had harsh words and treatment. They had three days in solitude in prison. Then they had proof of his love with the money in the sacks. They had a necessity forced upon them. You can't come back and see my face unless you bring Benjamin. They were shown great affection at the banquet. They were purged of their self-centeredness over the cup that was placed in Benjamin's sack and they had to either stand up for him or let him fall and walk away. And, and he's done all this in their life. And they didn't realize it since the very first time they met him, they'd been in Joseph's hand. They had always been in Joseph's hand. At any point, he could have done anything he wanted to do with them. It's important how they responded to him. When their sin is fully exposed, when they realize, oh my goodness, this is Joseph, and they've already told him before, you are as Pharaoh. They know the power this man has. They stand there speechless. And I've talked to so many people that honestly believe when they stand before a holy and righteous God, they're going to have some kind of an argument to give him, and there will be no words. His brethren could not answer him. Romans 3. And now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Repentance is nothing more than agreement. And God says you're a sinner and the only thing we can really say is yes. God says you're a savior and the only thing we can really say is yes. We stand speechless before him. You're in the hands of a Christ that you have rejected. You're in the hands of a Christ who will judge the quick, the living, those that know him, and the dead, those that do not know him. And he will judge both groups. The Father has put all judgment in the hand of Jesus Christ, and he's the one that stands before you today and asks you to come to him. Notice what Judah had to say. Judah said this, when he started his speech in, in the chapter before, he said, Let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. And the only thing we can say before God is don't let your anger burn. I need your mercy. I need your grace. 
It's good fortune for you and I to be in the absolute power of a God that loves us and a God that offers us mercy and a God that offers us grace. These men thought themselves pretty safe. Their sin's not going to rise up and accuse them. And at that moment when he said, I am Joseph, they saw themselves helpless and guilty before an all-powerful ruler that they had hated, rejected, and offended. And they trembled. It is an inescapable fact that every knee one day shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you can do that today or you can do it later. But later won't help you. Today will. These two men, Jesus and Joseph, are alike in what they said. Look at verse 4. Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. Come near to me, I pray you. Jesus didn't call you in anger. He called you in love. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He doesn't bark at you. He calls you in love. Joseph didn't raise his voice and say, get over here. He said, come near. Come near to me. I pray you, a phrase that means please. C come near to me, please. Let me wrap my arms around you. Jesus calls you to come to him. He calls privately. Joseph sent everybody out. Big room full of a lot of people, but God's talking to you. Big room, thousands here. Ignore them. God is speaking to you. He calls privately. He calls individually. He calls quietly. He calls lovingly. He spoke to them by name. Look at verse 14 and 15. He fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. Can you see the picture? As he goes from brother to brother to brother, Issachar, come here. Levi, come here. Reuben, let me put my arms around your neck. Dan, come to me. And God calls your name. God loves the world. When he says the world, he means you, every individual in that world. Jesus died for you. And he calls your name individually. Joseph didn't just love his brothers. Here we see love filled with grace. Forgiveness. The simple comment, come to me, come near to me, drips with forgiveness. Joseph was their brother. We're invited into the family as brothers. You don't need to turn to this, but I want to read this to you. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. And he answered and said unto him, Who's my mother? Who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Who is my brother? And he called his brothers to him. He said this, who's my brother? The one who does the will of the Father. Well, I, I can tell you what God's will is not. And it is, is not that you would perish. If his will is not that you perish, then his will, his will is that you come to him. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John 3, for God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God doesn't want you to perish. John 1, and as many as received him, gave you the power to become the sons of God. Well, how will you respond to him? If he's a son of God and he gives me the power to become a son of God, then he's calling me as his brethren. He's calling you to his family. He's calling you to get out of the family you're in and come into his family. And his will is that you would not perish. His desire is to forget what has happened in the past and bring peace to the family and peace to you individually. 
I love what he said in verse 11. Look, look, guys, I, I got, I've got plans for it. He'd already thought this through. He says, come to Goshen, verse 11, and there I will nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine. He'd already thought through what he was going to do. I've already picked a spot for you to come where I can nourish you and do wonderful things for you. Verse 9 just is something you need to be aware of. He said in verse 9, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. And you may be sitting there thinking, yeah, what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? If I am touched by the fact that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior and I come to Jesus Christ asking him my Savior, what's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. Everything he promised you was going to happen. He said, you go tell my father, I am Lord in Egypt. And whatever it is I'm promising you, I can do. And I will do. Tell my father of all my glory. The God that I am asking you to come to, the Savior that I'm asking you to come and give your sin to, and let him give you life, is not crumbled dust in a tomb in Jerusalem. He's alive. He's on a throne. He rules and he can do everything he's promised you he will do. Right. Jesus says to you, I know you. I know you. I knew you when you didn't know me. I love you. I so love you. I have drawn you to myself. I have prepared a place for you. I want you to come to my family. I want us to be family no matter how you have treated me up to this point. I am Joseph. He's at the well in John. And a lady comes up to him and they start a conversation. And she tries to get him all wrapped up into theological stuff. And she says, well, I know what you Jews think, but, but our, our ancestors said we're supposed to worship on yonder mountain. And, and she tries to wrap him up into all kinds of stuff. And he just ignores all of that. And finally, in frustration, she says, well, I know we can't know all these things. But when Messiah comes, Messiah will tell us all things. And Jesus looked at her and said, I that speak unto thee am he. Joseph said, I am Joseph. Jesus said, I am he. He knows you. He loves you. He wants you to respond to him. He can deliver what he promises. And I want this to ring in your ear just for a moment. Come near to me, I pray you. See your Savior asking you to come near to him. And then as if God isn't almighty and God doesn't speak and all things are, he says to you, as a gentleman would say, he says, please, come near to me, I pray you. Do you know him? If you don't know him, you can know him. And I pray you will. And he stands before you this morning and says who he is. He's Savior. He's Son of God. He's Savior of the world. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And He wants to take away yours if you'd come to Him and you'd let Him do what He came to do. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord, coming to you from the Campus Church at Pensacola Christian College. Your financial help is vital in keeping the Rejoice telecast on the air. With your tax-deductible gift, this viewer-supported ministry can continue to reach the world with the good news. Please let us know how Rejoice has been a blessing to you. Rejoice TV messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus, this is Rejoice in the Lord.